Welcome, my name's Chris Day from Everyday Sustainable Living. We're here with the City of Onkaparinga to talk about composting as part of a three-part series. And in particular, we're going to be talking about worms and worm farming. Now, there's a whole myriad of different ways of worm farming and we'll be touching on, on some common ways of keeping worms. Now, what is composting? Composting in the broader sense is the decomposition slash breaking up of organic matter into something called humus. Humus is a building block in soil and it's basically plant superfood. So it's what plants use to store their water, their nutrients and gain energy and nutrients from. And composting accelerates the breakdown of this organic matter with beneficial microbes and fungi and then we put that on our garden and that helps to increase our soil health, our activity, our water holding capacity and our soil life which in turn makes our plants, us and the planet healthier. Now worm farms are a fantastic way to do this. Worms, there's over a thousand species of worms in Australia. Of those, around about 80 of them are introduced. And most of them are what I call free range worms. So they're out in the garden, they're off in the oval, and they're burrowing around. They're quite different to what, so they're earthworms. They're quite different than compost worms. Compost worms have developed in a subtropical environment where they have constant moisture, high rich carbon and nitrogen food, and they only really live in the top layer of the soil. And they require that moist, warm, but not too cold and not too hot environment. So worm farming is where we want to emulate that. We need to get compost worms, so we need to get them from either uh, a worm supplier or a nursery or a friend or a community garden. We don't go into the garden and just lift up rocks and dig through the soil. There are different species of worms and the ones in the garden won't do as well in a worm farm. Compost worms are meant to be used in a composting system and they flourish with our kitchen waste and food scraps. So the main varieties of compost worms are red wrigglers, blue Indian worms and tiger worms. Usually you'll get a mix of those. It doesn't really matter what worms you have, as long as you know that they are a composting worm, they'll do your job. Now what do worms like? I always find that it's beneficial to pretend I'm a worm uh, and what I would like. So if I was a worm, I like darkness. I don't like the sun. So we want to create a dark environment. I also like moisture. If I was in the full sun, another avenue of light, I'd dry out, I'd be become desiccated and I'd probably get eaten by birds. So I want to hide. I want to hide in the darkness in a moist environment. I don't like swimming pools because I can't swim. So I can't get too moist but I like to be nice and moist like your kitchen sponge or like a nice pot plant that's been watered once a week sort of thing. And very similar managing a worm farm to pot plants. They need less water in the winter and more water in the summer. The other similarity is temperature. So if you've got a sensitive pot plant, it's not going to love full sun on a 40 degree day. Same with your worms. Your temperature range of worms ideally is somewhere between 10 and 30 degrees. If it gets much hotter than that, then they start to get stressed. If it gets much colder, they sort of just get really cold. So in the winter time, you want to have your worm farm in the sun. Moving into spring and summer, you want to try and get it into as much shade as possible, especially the hot western sun. A few different ways of doing that. I'm standing under a veranda, which gets the shade in the west. Great spot for a worm farm. They won't smell, and you're going to use it because you're coming in and outside of the house with your food scraps. So it's very easy to use, and it's somewhere where you won't forget about it. So that's quite important. The other good way to think about is deciduous trees and vines. So in the summertime, they have leaves, um, like up here on this veranda, and they'll fill out and make this whole place shady and cooler. They'll transpire, make it moister, and then the whole atmosphere cooler and shady. 
And then in the winter time, those leaves fall and create and let that sun in. So that's ideal. Fruit trees are similar, deciduous fruit trees. So you can actually put them under a fruit tree, make sure it's pretty close to your house so you're gonna remember about it. And again, that'll do that function. With smaller worm farms are very easy to move. So on extreme days, like extremely hot days, you can even bring them into your house or into your laundry. Um, they won't smell, they'll smell earthy, and that might save your worms. Now, again, um, embodying the worm, on a 40 degree day, we're not gonna really, we're gonna need more water, we're gonna need something to cool it. So, the shade's one thing. Having a damp cloth or something on top is quite important, keeping that moist. Also, we love ice cream and ice blocks in the hot weather, so do worms. So we can actually freeze an ice cream container of water, not ice cream, uh, and put that in our worm farm to help keep that temperature down. The main, re the main feedback I get from people ringing up and telling me they've lost their worms and they need some more, uh, they died in the heat. So that's quite important uh, coming into summer that we think about how we're going to keep that worm farm cool. Um, so the shade and moisture being the operative thing there. Now, having said all this, what are the benefits of having a worm farm? So, there's multiple benefits. Basically, the worm castings, or worm poo, is like humus. It's rich, it's colloidal, uh, it holds nutrients, it makes nutrients available, and it's full of beneficial bacteria and fungi, which your plants love. We also get a liquid from the worm farm, and this liquid is a fantastic balanced and pH neutral fertilizer, which we can dilute one to 10, or a weak tea color, and put directly on our plants. It makes things absolutely thrive. Uh, and in my experience from gardens that haven't been going well, as soon as you start adding worm castings or worm liquid, it really gets the microbial life in the soil going and helps the plants access those nutrients and minerals that they need. So it really does help things grow. The other thing is it's fun for kids, young and old. Um, it's just an enjoyable thing, caring for a different animal. I think in some ways a worm farm is more useful than a dog or a cat in terms of production. Uh, but obviously dogs and cats have, have their place and their enjoyment. So worm farms are just like a pet, so you need to look after them similarly. Uh, but they give you a great reward. Fantastic for kids as well, learning about how things live and function and um, breed and multiply. Now, there's different types of worm farms. They range in size and, and shape they, and, and budget. So basically you can have anything as simple as a styrofoam box with, with a drainage hole to a commercial worm farm. Uh, so basically a, a, a plastic tub with a lid and drainage holes in the tap to larger worm farms such as bathtubs and fridges and things like that. So let's have a look at some different ways we can keep worms. Like I was saying, the simple, quite a simple and DIY cheap method of doing it is you grab a, a bucket, an old mayonnaise bucket or whatever it may be, and you drill some holes in it. So you're drilling holes about halfway up the sides and in the bottom. Now, the holes doesn't really matter exactly what size they are, but keeping on, on the theme of imagining if you're a worm, you need to be able to get through those holes um, and it needs to be able to drain. So, and then basically we just bury that in the soil and we can put a lid on there with some holes in the top to make sure things we don't want to get in there. So that's a fantastic way. Let's say that's my garden bed. Bury it in your, in your soil. Works really well in raised beds and wicking beds uh, and will also just work in, in the ground. So there's your bucket in situ worm farm. The main thing with any worm farm is that you have good drainage. So I've got a lot of holes in there to make sure it's got good drainage. The same with a styrofoam box, you need to make sure that the water can drain away because again they don't like swimming and you can they can drown so they need drainage. The other one is one of the round cafes which uh, the city of Onkaparinga subsidise and stock which are a fantastic tidy little unit 
works quite well on a, on a balcony or in a small space and will also show us the best sort of method of keeping worms. So it's got a, a collection tray and a tap. I usually leave the tap on and I leave a bucket underneath and that the liquid worm castings comes out into that bucket. When that's getting full I know I need to use it. So it's a good way or a good reminder for me to do that. It also makes sure that the water doesn't build up too high in there and gets a bit more airflow. Now you might wonder why there's so many layers. Well, it's so we can build up on top of them. But we only need one layer to start with. I'm going to put those aside in the shed for a while. And we're just going to start with one layer. So it's got lots of holes in the bottom. And that's going to sit on top of that water collection reservoir. We've got that. Now, we need then some sort of bedding material. I find that newspaper, the best thing to do with it generally is to compost it. Uh, I put one or two layers in the bottom when I first set up a tray just to stop the, the worms and things falling down. So I do that. And then, one of two things. You can get some coconut coir. This is quite a large block. The worm farms do actually come with a small block uh, which you soak in a bucket for a few hours and what that does, here's one I prepared earlier, is it come, turns into this really lovely free draining substance that holds water but when it gets too wet it lets it go. So that's a fantastic media for worms to live in and that forms their bed. That basically so we're putting that, so that's one small brick that was supplied in this farm that I've soaked overnight and I've put that in there. Spread that around. So that's their bed. The other thing you can do, which is quite fun, is you grab some newspaper and you rip it into small strips. And kids especially kids, but even big kids like myself really enjoy that activity. And you do that until you've got a similar layer, similar to that coir, and mix that with some garden soil or potting soil to create a base. In my opinion, if you can have access to coconut coir, I would go that because it works really well. The paper does is a good carbon food source, so it's got lots of little particles that the worms, when moist, make sure you water it well, when moist, the worms will eat that. The next thing is you add your worms. Alright, so the next thing is we add our worms. So we've got this from one of our established worm farms that we'll look at later. And it's a good way to make multiple farms in case one fails or just to get more production. So you can see here, you've got some lovely castings and you've got some lovely wriggly worms. So there's a mix of red wrigglers and tiger worms in here and they are rearing to get into a new farm. So what we do is we just make a little depression in there, we tip them in try and get them all out of the bucket, they won't like being in there by themselves and then we just cover them with a little bit of that coir, tuck them into their bed, and grab a newspaper and put that on top. You can either grab a newspaper, I say that because it's, it, it's also, they can also eat it if they get hungry. We water that, and that becomes what I call the blanket. So that's, we tuck them in after we put them in there, we tuck them in. When we feed them, we untuck them, peel it back, feed them, and tuck it back in. Now, the other thing that can come with these farms is a worm blanket. It can be round or square, and that acts in the same way. So, basically, you just want some sort of material, whether it's a worm blanket, whether it's an old towel, an old shirt, cardboard, paper, whatever, you need some sort of blanket which you put on top, and keep moist and then you peel back to feed it and you put it back. What that does in whatever worm farm you're using is it helps keep the moisture consistent 
the worms come right up and eat the stuff that's on top and it stops that top layer drying out. It also stops things like vinegar flies and other things coming into your farm because it's covered. So if you don't cover it, you'll sometimes get these little flies and things coming in there to try and also break down your food. This is a good way of keeping it covered and keeping those things out. It also helps maintain the moisture in the farm and acts as a secondary cooling, cooling layer and, and a blanket, so it's an insulator. Once we've done that, we pop our lid on and away we go. Now you might have noticed I haven't fed them yet. It's not so important to feed them as soon as you put them in there. But if you do, because it's always an exciting thing, start with small amounts. So just start with a handful. Generally, a, a thousand worms is about 250 grams of worms. So you're looking at feeding them approximately that amount of food. So 250 grams or a couple of handfuls of food every couple of days. So it's not a huge amount to start with, but as you go, the worms will breed up and you'll notice they'll eat that food quicker and that's when you start increasing your food. So I'm peeling the blanket back. I'm just going to add a handful of food. Now, sometimes things will be a bit big. Just take that couple of seconds. You can either, some people have a little blender dedicated to their worm farms. Uh, the smaller the particle, the quicker your worms will eat them. You don't necessarily need a blender, just some secateurs will do. Banana peels, I love banana peels, but just breaking that up a little bit will make it easier for the worms to eat. Um, now, and I've I had some carrot in there that went bad, so I've cut that up into some smaller pieces. Um, Eggshells are fine, just give them a little crush. And citrus. Citrus we want to avoid. So that can go in our compost or our bakashi or our um, green bin. So we keep that out of the worm farm. And the other thing we keep out is garlic. So citrus, garlic, any really strong acidic foods or garlic is actually a wormer. So we keep those things out of there. Um, pretty much anything else we can feed our worm farm. Anything that's natural, anything that's organic, was once living, we can feed our worm farm. Once we've finished feeding it, tuck them back in, back in our lid. We can put a small bucket under here with the tap on and that liquid will come out. Now, um, maintaining and managing your worm farm. So small amounts of food often is much better than a heap of food at once. So that's probably one of the key things in managing your worm farm. They don't like an anaerobic environment, so they don't like a big, you don't fill up this bucket for two weeks and then go, oh, let's go feed the worms. Because what will happen is there won't be enough oxygen in there, there'll be too much nitrogen, and that'll become anaerobic, putrid and smelly, and the worms won't like that and they'll try and get away. Uh, it'll form an acid environment and they don't like that at all. So small amounts of um, on regular intervals is key. A couple of handfuls, wait until that mostly disappears and do it again. Right, so we continue feeding the worm farm every few days, small amounts of food. As we're doing that, the worms are breeding. They're breeding in population and they'll be eating slowly, slowly more food, decomposing that, that vegetable waste that you're adding into there and turning that into castings. Slowly, slowly, the level of the decomposing matter is building up inside that worm farm. But this is the point where the two different managements come in. So with this particular worm cafe, you've got these different layers. So we're building upwards. With a, a bathtub or a, a laundry sink or something like that with just one layer, instead of building upwards, we're going sideways. So we're feeding one side and not the other. We're letting them eat this side and make this into castings and then this, this side you're not feeding, basically that'll all form to castings. The rest of the worms, most of the worms will be here where you're feeding them and we can harvest this side. 
So that's, that's on a single layer tier, is we're working that way. With this multi-layered tier, so we've got three layers, we're working upwards. So as those castings build up, we take the blanket off, and you'll notice inside here, there's these little steps. So once the castings and some vegetable scraps, but it's mostly breaking down or breaking down worm castings, gets to just to this line above those little nooks, that's when we add the next layer on top. Now that, the bottom of this tray is in contact, it's pressing firmly against that layer. That's quite important because that's how the worms get up into this next layer. So we don't need to start all that big process with the coir and stuff again. We can just literally put some veggie scraps in here, some shredded paper, put our blanket on there, water it, put our lid back on, and the worms will slowly, slowly make their way up there over a number of weeks. As time goes on, weeks go on, months go on, as you're filling this up, you'll be amazed at how quickly it actually reduces that food waste you're putting in there. So it compresses and it turns into this lovely, rich, black humus-like substance. So it's gonna be going down as you're adding to it. You're gonna, is it ever gonna fill up? It will eventually. At that point when the second tray is full, you wanna check your original tray to see if that's fully decomposed into this nice chocolatey black substance. If so, you can actually harvest that and this can become your new tray. If that's still got a bit of a way to go, we'll grab our third layer, same thing again, we remove that blanket, it's up past these lugs and this bottom layer is in firm contact with that and they'll come up to here. With all three layers in operation, it will help to maintain the temperature a little bit better uh, and just give it a bit more sort of resilience. Also, as you water it, so like I said earlier, we're dealing with a, a living creature and it's a little bit like a pot plant in the sense that we want to be constantly watering it. We can actually tip water through there and as the water passes through the worm castings, it's actually picking up nutrients and coming out as compost tea, as, as worm tea. So that's one way to, if you want more tea, then you just water your farm, and that sort of cleanses your farm, brings out the nutrients out of here, and then that increases the amount of worm liquid that you've got to use in your garden. So you don't have to wait for it just to seep out. It's a good idea to make sure you're keeping that nice and moist. Now, in terms of harvesting, so this bottom layer, not the very bottom layer, the first layer we started in, not the liquid layer, that's going to be fully decomposed. So that's where we take that out, we tip that onto a tarp, and we expose it to the light, and basically the worms will go down and we can scrape off those castings. Uh, then we put our layer back on and we keep rotating so we've basically usually got one one or two spare usually one spare tray that's off to the side and we're switching, switching those around with the single tray systems we're taking off the side we're not feeding harvesting that side and then leaving the side we're feeding in there spreading that over same principle let's go have a look at some worm farms that we've set up. So we'll also have a look at some beautiful liquid worm castings. So this has been, water's been poured through these worm farms with a watering can, rainwater ideally, it's been poured through and that's what comes out. So that goes through the castings. We then use this, we dilute it roughly one to 10 so that's one litre to 10 litres or uh, 100 mils to one litre. And we can use that as a foliar feed and also a liquid feed for our plants. Fantastic fertiliser, really makes your plants pop. So let's have a look. This is showing three different systems. When I was saying how you've just got one layer, this is a, a DIY version. So it's just an old laundry sink 
and a, and a wooden lid. And we've got one layer in there. We've got a little blanket. And as you can see, we're in a lovely shady position. Western, we get western shade. We've got a deciduous tree here, a plum. We've got some great vines over our, our head. And we've even got a monstera here that's adding a bit of extra shade and, and humidity. If you come and have a look into this worm farm, you'll actually see a whole lot of things growing. They look like pumpkins to me, but that's all right because what will happen is that they'll, they'll grow up and then once they don't have any light, they'll actually just compost back into the worm farm and become a food. We could even take some of those in the right time of year, such as spring, and put them in our garden and have our own pumpkins. So we put that blanket back on there, put that lid back on there, and that's the simple one tray system where we're feeding half of the worm farm, leaving one half non-fed, one half fed, and we'll harvest the castings from that non-fed side and layer it back. Here we've got currently a farm that's only got one layer currently, almost ready for two. So if we open up that lid, we've got our blanket, our newspaper blanket here, and you'll see how we're feeding this side not so much over here and you can feed them paper they love paper as long as see how that's nice and moist it's not dry and as we dig into here we'll actually start to see how they're making this beautiful worm castings and look at those healthy worms fantastic now we'll also find things like worm eggs so they're little worm eggs Inside those eggs will be anywhere from 2 to 20 little baby worms that will hatch out of there. As you can see, there's not too much food in there. Look how beautifully and finely that's chopped up. So those worms can act on that nice and quickly and break that down into lovely compost. You'll note that each one of these farms has a bucket underneath their tap and it's filling up with castings as it goes. And thirdly, we've got a double tray system here. We've got a, a worm blanket on there. And this tray looks like it's almost ready for its next layer. It's got lovely castings in here. It's recently just been stirred before this video. And um, that's looking fantastic. Now, just found a little bone in here. That's fine, because what they'll do is they'll actually eat the inside of the bone out that bone won't necessarily compost but it will eventually break down um, into over several years but don't expect that to disappear in there but all of this other stuff it's hardly recognizable anymore there's just a few green particles things like avocado skins will take a little while those once they've been in there for a while they'll break up now I've been a bit naughty here with my corn cobs. I haven't cut them, but you'll see that they actually eat from the outside and slowly it'll decompose. If I want them to eat that quicker, I'll just cut that into a few sections and they'll make much quicker work of that. Now, a few troubleshooting type things and questions, common questions and things that I get. Um, one's how I get the liquid, so I've covered that, or extra liquid through the worm farm, goes through the castings and it comes out. Always leave my taps open because it's such a great product to use. The other thing are unwanted critters. So you've got a few of them that can happen, but generally due to not quite the right conditions, so they're a good indicator that you need to make a change. So the first one that comes to mind is these little tiny white worms. White worms? That's generally a sign that it's a little bit too acidic in there and you might be overfeeding them. So the best way to deal with that is to, to stir your farm, stop feeding them so much veggie scraps for a week or so, and add more carbon-based material, such as soaked cardboard or paper, uh, things like that. And those, those worms will, those non-beneficial worms, 
will disappear. They're not anything to worry about. They won't hurt anything or they don't really hinder the process. They are composting. They're just not composting worms. Nothing to really worry about, just something to keep in mind. Good little indicator. What can also help is just getting some garden lime uh, or worm compost conditioner, which is basically gardener's lime. And you just sprinkle a small layer, a, a fine layer on top. A bit like icing a cake. And that will help raise the pH and stop it being acidic. That also works really well for ants. So a bit like ants in the compost, uh, ants in the worm farm are an indication that it might be a bit dry and a bit acidic. So when I've had that happen, I add a bit of dolomite lime, about as much as I put in, maybe a bit more, water that in, and the ants will pretty much leave straight away. So that's one way of doing it. If you have a real problem with ants, like you've got lots of ants in your yard, you can actually put little containers of water around your legs or you could put Vaseline or some sort of barrier to stop the ants crawling up into your farm if you do have ongoing problems. The third thing, uh, you may get flies and maggots. If you followed what I've said earlier in the video and, and that we're covering the food scraps, we're not feeding them too much, it won't be an issue. If it does become an issue, you can either remove that uh, and again, similarly, reduce the amount of rich nitrogen-rich foods, feed more of this sort of carbon-based foods, and that will come back into balance. A big one I get is why are my worms dying in summer, generally? The biggest answer to that is generally they don't have enough shade and airflow and coolness. So this area, as you can see, really lovely and shaded in there. It's going to stay cool and the deciduous trees are making that cooler and shadier. Also, the active management of the worm farm, so keeping them moist, you can water them daily, it's not going to hurt them. So keeping that nice and moist, putting blankets and cloths and things. With these black worm farms or these plastic worm farms, I tend to actually remove the lids and just put a wet hessian or wet cloth or something on top so there's enough airflow in there. Uh, and I'm keep that moist. You can with these systems and like the worm cafe that we were looking at earlier, quite easily transport them inside if you know you're in for a, a week of 45 degrees and that's going to be quite tricky. The other thing is those ice blocks. So having an ice block, uh, an ice cream container of frozen water in the fridge and adding that on really hot days. As we've talked about, there's a range of different options to keep worms. There's your in situ DIY bucket where you can put it in the ground or in a raised bed. There's your uh, bathtubs or sinks or make your own worm farm. And then there's also your commercially made, pre-made worm farms with your trays and your tap. The beauty is, City of Onkaparinka offer a subsidy for worm farms for residents. So you can get these farms at a great price to help encourage people to do worm farming and composting. So hopefully this video has opened up your eyes to a range of different worm farming techniques and answered some of those common questions. For more info, links and go to the website and other links at the end of this video and you'll be able to find out more. Thank you very much for listening and we hope you have a fantastic worm farming experience.